In war, what are the main factors that determine which side is going to win a battle? That's a big question, right? Probably too big to ever effectively answer. If you were to try, you could maybe start at the strategic level and look at the population and economic strength and industrial power of the two countries involved. At the tactical level, you could look at the disposition of the two armies, the equipment they're outfitted with, and maybe the leadership of their generals or admirals. And then you could get all the way down to the personal level, individual soldiers, their training, their morale, their fighting spirit, whatever you want to call it. Wars and battles are determined by a weird mess of factors, some stuff you can measure, the size of the guns, the number of troops involved, and things you can't. The skill and bravery of soldiers, or just plain luck on each side. But let's imagine for a second we have two armies, identical in every way. From the number of soldiers involved, to the equipment they're using, to the effectiveness of their tactics and strategy, all the way down to that individual bravery and leadership. It's really more like a game of chess, everything is perfectly balanced. Well, how would that balance be affected if on one side every soldier was a duplicate of the same individual? A clone army facing down a force of regularly recruited normal people. Which of those innumerable factors would switch from favoring one side to the other? Now, obviously, that's going to depend on the type of clone army involved. The Grand Army of the Republic fights very different from the Jem'Hadar. But there's one inherent weakness that I think would be shared across every clone army, and it's something I thought about while watching the recent exploits of Clone Force 99, or the Bad Batch. Unlike the rest of the Republic's army, which was made up by identical clones, the soldiers of the Bad Batch exhibited a number of genetic anomalies. One possessed enhanced senses, another one was an expert marksman, another one had nearly superhuman strength. But these physical characteristics aren't really the point. The point is, because each clone was adept at a different method of warfare, they approached every problem from a unique perspective. And this is a fundamental advantage that I think most clone armies would lack. There's the idea that there is strength and diversity, and while that phrase has become something of a cliché, it happens to be true. When you bring together individuals with unique life experiences, who can each approach a problem from a different perspective, it might be harder to get them all facing the right way, but once they do, they're going to solve that problem much quicker and more efficiently than a group that all thinks the same way. It's mentioned that the clones used by the Republic were genetically engineered to be predisposed towards creative thinking, but how creative can you really be when your entire childhood, your entire life, has been spent in military training with people identical to you? As with everything else in life, if you want to be an effective soldier or an effective leader, you need to be willing to embrace outside perspectives and be challenged by new ideas. The Republic's clone troops, for all their strengths, have been raised in an environment where this is an impossibility. They're rigid and probably going to break before they bend. The Kamino clone engineers tried to give their soldiers every possible advantage, but there have been plenty of times across history when someone raised in a proud military tradition, given every possible opportunity and expected to accomplish great things, has nevertheless been defeated by a rival who might have been given only a fraction of those opportunities, or even be entirely self-taught. It's impossible to predict what otherwise disconnected element from your life experiences might suddenly become a critical factor when you need to solve a problem or accomplish a goal. I think Clone Force 99 is so effective because their genetic abnormalities, their disabilities, whatever it is, force them to see life through a different lens. And I think that's much more important than having slightly better senses, better marksmanship, or superhuman strength. To go back to our earlier example, those two balanced forces, that chess game, I think in that instance the side with the clones might as well be fielding all pawns. Sure, they're disciplined and reliable, but they can only make a limited set of moves. But this isn't to say that clones are inherently a bad way to field an army or that the Republic shouldn't have used them. Like I said, there's so many factors that go into deciding who is going to win a battle. That extra bit of individuality, the unique method of solving problems, is that going to be the deciding factor enough of the time to warrant abandoning clone armies in favor of regular recruitment? It's hard to say. But I'd like to hear your thoughts. Is diversity too great an advantage to ever give up? Can clone armies evolve past their initial programming to become more effective? 
And who would win, the Grand Army of the Republic or the Jem'Hadar? It's the Jem'Hadar, but I'd still like to hear your thoughts in the comments below. And until next time, this has been a Templin Dispatch.